Aloha, I'm Carol Mon Lee, and this is Education Matters on ThinkTech. We define education broadly on this show by exploring a wide variety of topics. Today's program is Leaving Legacies for Hawaii and covers philanthropy, and in particular, planned giving, or gifts after we pass away, which are more important than ever. Um, my guest is Jeff Peterson, the Director of Planned Giving at the Foundations of Hawaii Pacific Health. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Great. So tell us a little bit about Hawaii Pacific Health and your role in it. I know Hawaii Pacific Health is a very important um, position in our community. Uh, we have four hospitals. We are a nonprofit health care system. Um, Wilcox, Poly Wilcox, Wilcox on Kauai, on Kauai Polymomi, and of course Kapilani Medical Center for Women and Children, and Straub Clinic and Hospital, all their clinics. So yes. you, so the four hospitals are under the Hawaii Pacific Health umbrella? Correct. Right. And then the foundations, each hospital has a foundation that is set up to receive, raise money for, and receive gifts uh, for that institution. I see. And what is your role as director of planned giving? I work on both uh, mainly legacy giving. Uh, planned giving and legacy giving is really larger gifts. They tend to be planned out with attorneys they tend, or family members. It's more than just writing out a check, uh, generally. See. Okay, so for our, for our viewers, distinguish for us philanthropy, which is the, over, the bigger mm -hmm. picture, right, and planned giving and legacy giving. At what point in time are those taking place? Um, generally, when you look at any nonprofit, there's usually three income streams to support that mission or that institution. Uh, generally, they start out with annual giving, uh, maybe a direct mail campaign where solicitations go out in the mail and people can send in a check. Uh, those fall under the annual giving uh, umbrella. Uh, and so that's during lifetime? During lifetime. You, right now, you, like today, before April 15th, I might want to give a gift, or before year end, I might want to give a gift. You'll get home today, and in the mailbox, there's going to be a number of envelopes, number 10 envelopes with your name on it, and all sorts of uh, wonderful stories of why you should give to that charitable institution and how you can make a difference by writing out a check to support that institution, or, of course, today, going online and making a gift online. So those typically are the foundation for most organizations' fundraising efforts. They tend to be uh, smaller gifts in terms of 10, 20, maybe $100, but a lot of them. So that's the basic foundation. Then from there, you'll have what is generally called major giving. Um, those gifts are a little bit larger. They tend to, large depends on the institution. At one institution, it could be $500. At another institution, it could be $5,000. Um, but again, those typically are current gifts where people are making a, a uh, monetary gift to support that institution today. And then planned giving or deferred giving typically comes from a person's, their assets, not what's in their checking account. It could be a gift of stock. It could be a gift of real estate. It could be a bequest uh, or a gift in a person's will or trust. All of those tend to take more planning through advisors. It, they take more thought uh, from uh, an individual or a couple. And that's the role that I play in. I work in that area. I see. So the distinction between current versus future giving. Yes. And under future is plan giving. Yes. Or if they're larger, you call them legacy yes. gifts. Yes. I see. Okay, well, let's take it to, from the side of the donor. Okay, yes. So who am I going to choose? I know you mentioned nonprofits, but I might have interest in a variety of um, causes that I want to support. There's a couple ways to look at this. Um, first is in terms of regular nonprofits that will go out and solicit money. In those annual gifts and those major gifts, that nonprofit is usually coming to you, telling their story, asking you, Carol, to give them money. And they're saying, here's what I'm going to do with, my, with your money. I have, I have to build something. I have to save something. Plan giving tends to be more, um, it's reversed. The institution will sit down with the donor and say, Carol, tell me what's important to you. What do you want to support? Why are you connected to this institution? Why have you been giving $10 for the last 20 years? And if it's done right, um, the planned giving person will listen. And 
and hear that story and find out why that person, why that donor is connected to the institution, what their story is, and then go from there. Okay, so in Hawaii, you mentioned earlier that there are not that many directors of planned giving like you in Hawaii. That's why right. Why is that? Uh, it's a technical um, uh, position. Um, institutions have to be large enough to afford a dedicated person to focus on this. And again, a lot of these gifts come in later and a lot of institutions do not have the luxury of money to be able to support a person who can focus on the long term. We just, for example, received a gift on Friday uh, from an estate, a wonderful woman. Uh, she had been a donor to Kapilani Medical Center for Women and Children. Her first gift came in 10 years ago. It was $100. And the following year, she gave $1,000. But that was it, and her total lifetime giving was just $1,100. Um, she passed away two years ago, and I've been working with um, the uh, attorneys and their financial people for two years, and now we received a gift on, on Friday of $690,000. Oh my goodness, so she had already planned, of course, before she passed away, yes. to designate yes. Kapiolani as yes. the recipient of this money. Exactly. So that's the planned part. She did it before she died, but yes. you didn't get it until... We didn't get it till 10 years later. Till 10 years 2009, later. we had a nice lunch. She said she would like to do something in her estate. Uh, she connected me with her attorney. We worked through some paperwork. We put a provision in her, her trust. And over the years, we visited her. We had lunch with her. We, we spent a lot of time with her um, just as a, a donor. And uh, yeah, and now here it is in 2017, the gift comes in. So mechanically, you mentioned you know you uh, as yes. the director worked with her before she passed away, yes, and uh, did the tax work and the paperwork, yes. But what if she changed her mind before she passed away? Can she do that? Oh, absolutely. Right. Um, it would be unusual for a person to make an irrevocable gift to a, a charity. Usually they want to um, retain the right to change their mind. And that that's the donor's prerogative and that's the way most people do it, absolutely. So what percentage of then um, of the donations that you receive every year are based on are, are, are current gifts and what percentage are the return on this future gift? Well, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, just with this lady um, and also normally for Hawaii Pacific Health, we process, we have wonderful donors, probably uh, 18,000 plus gifts a year are given to support uh, the hospitals of Hawaii Pacific Health. So the four hospitals get about 18,000 gifts a 18, year? 18,000 gifts. Small we, and large? Small and large, $10, $100, $1,000. Um, those annual giving um, campaigns or, or initiatives and efforts will generate uh, anywhere from four to five million dollars to support uh, the institutions. So the, there we have four or five million dollars and then all of a sudden one woman um, decides to leave us in her estate and we get six hundred and ninety thousand. So it's kind of lopsided and yeah that's that's why people look at that's why institutions look at planned giving. I see, I yeah. see. So now, of course, we're talking about health care. Right. And there's so many other nonprofits in Hawaii. And is it the same procedure then for, in general, if uh, someone was interested in, in, in another cause to oh, create uh, yes, what plan I've, giving? I've given examples of what I'm familiar with in terms of our institution, but what I, what I have shared with you would be across the board, from universities to churches to any, any of the nonprofit institutions. I see. Uh, yes. So I understand there are, but aren't there different approaches to? Oh, very definitely. Um, so through this whole world of uh, legacy planning, and as we get into that, there's different ways to approach what I just shared with you. Some, t some institutions will take a more technical approach. So you may sit down with a plan giving person at a university. Um, they may be more uh, focused on the technical gift vehicles, charitable trusts, charitable annuities, and really talking about how these different types of uh, instruments 
uh, their benefits, their, the way they can uh, tax help. Benefits. Tax benefits. Tax mm -hmm. benefits. Uh, yes, and they may approach plan giving in more of a technical uh, mechanical. aspect. Mechanical. Mechanical. A lot of paperwork. Um, y yes, yeah. we live. We li <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely, there's a lot of paperwork. Um, but they'll approach it that way. Right. Now, from my perspective, I've been doing this for uh, a number of years. I have found that I do more, uh, I, my approach is more legacy planning. I really start with the families and their values and what is it that they are looking to accomplish. And then those technical vehicles are mere um, vehicles of solutions once we figure out what that family wants to accomplish. So and, how small though, because um, we're talking about families and kind of big uh, supporting hospitals. but. Yes. Do you have to be rich to, to do this? No. And um, how do you define rich? And how do you define rich and everything? But year, years ago, you would think of a planned gift or somebody in my position working with uh, millionaires who are making million dollar gifts. Uh, today, uh, people can make a big impact and you may not need to have a million dollars. You can make a big gift with $50,000. Um, now, $50,000 is a lot of money. Sure. Um, and at the same time, in today's society, it's a really nice car. I mean, it's not, it's not, $50,000 isn't what it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, uh, $50,000 for a lot of institutions will make a big difference. Yes? Great. So, um, you have some more stories about uh, some of the donors that you have. You mentioned the 650000 one. Do you have stories of maybe smaller donors? Oh, oh absolutely. Uh, and it's really not so much about, m from my work, I, I mentioned the 600, whatever, 90,000. Right. Because it gives some context to the role of plan giving in a fundraising effort. But when we sit down with a family, it's really talking to them about what is important to them. And typically, you know this, you, you have a family, we have families and friends. Generally, people want four things I have found. The first is they don't want their family to be destitute. So whatever legacy planning we do, we start with the family, recognizing that the family is first and foremost in terms of what you're going to do in terms of leaving, leaving money to your children or the heirs could be nieces or nephews. You don't want them to be destitute. The second piece that we find is they want families, I want this as a parent, I want to provide opportunities to my children and grandchildren. I want them to be able to, whatever they want to do, whether it's go to school or, 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 or whatever, they, they want opportunities. I have worked, I just thought of the fact that when I started doing this, I, uh, I worked with a lot of World War II generation guys. And I remember a gentleman who said to me, um, he said, Jeff, I landed on the beaches of Sicily. I lost a lot of my friends on the beach. He said, I want to give opportunities to young people to do things because I, I didn't have those opportunities. And so we, we look at providing opportunities. And then thirdly, we have families who say, I do not want to promote a non-working lifestyle for my children. So you don't uh, want to give them everything. You don't want to give them everything right. because they recognize that they're, they don't want them sitting on the couch watching TV, drinking beer, and not doing anything. They want them to be productive human beings and contributing to society. And fourth? And fourth, the um, families n not fighting. Right. We want to create an estate plan that allows families to be uh, working in harmony and not at each other's throats okay. or estranged. So, so we start there. Start and then there. we move forward to figure out how that would, okay. how to do that. Well, let's take a second on that, and we're going to take a short break. We're talking about legacy giving. Thank with you, Jeff Peterson from Hawaii Pacific Health. We'll be right back after this short break. All right. This guy looked familiar. He calls himself the Ultra Fan, but that doesn't explain all this. What? Why? He planned this party, planned the snacks, he even planned to coordinate colored shirts, but he didn't plan to have a good time. Go! Oh! Oh! Now you wouldn't do this in your own house, so don't do it in your team's house. Know your limits and plan ahead so that everyone can have a good time.
you. Kindness. Pass it on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. Uh, welcome back. This is Carol Monley with my guest Jeff Peterson from Hawaii Pacific Health, and we're talking about planned giving, a very important topic for our viewers. So when we, just before the break, we talked about the four factors that you go through with uh, donors to make sure that their families are covered, which are very exactly. important. Exactly. So once that's been done, mm -hmm. and assuming an individual has more resources than are needed to cover the needs of their family, but as you said, not give them so much right. that the family, the children become um, they need to be productive members be productive. of society. Right. So <laughs> exactly. here is now the next step of where you come in, right? Mm -hmm. um, I would uh, typically sit down with a family and talk to them, talk story with them, and find out what their uh, their background is. As I said, why they're connected to the institution, and then their life story and how they made their money, what that means to them, their values. We also talk about their, uh, if they have children, their children. Can their children manage money? Um, many parents, um, while they love their children, find that they may not be able to manage large sums of money and that maybe a trust would be better. Um, so we look at some of those factors. And then for our pers from our perspective, we, ask, we do general legacy planning, meaning it's not just for the hospital. So if a family says to us, as we sit down and we say, what's important to you, to you Carol? And the, the donor might say, well, I'm involved in the symphony, and I went to school at this institution, and I might volunteer at, the, uh, at some other nonprofit, and in our case, a hospital. There might be, generally when I work with families, they usually have at least four or five charities that they are connected to. And so you help? We help with that. But do people find you, though, through their interest in one of the four hospitals? Yes. Okay, so yes. first they say, okay, I yes. want to give something to Kapilani, and then you might step in and yes. talk about their possible... The, their general le legacy planning. Uh, we do not go out and, I'll use these sales terms, cold call on people and say, hi, hi, Carol, you don't know me, you don't know Kapilani. And Let do you get a commission? No, that's right. the thing. No, this is true across all uh, foundations. Plan giving people are really a great resource to talk to, and many times they are, let me use the word, honest broker, in the sense that they're not selling anything. They're not uh, selling are we insurance. You as the public? No. So you're not being, you're not selling anything, and you're not being paid by the donor. By a commission or a donor, there's okay. nothing like that. Uh, plan giving people get a salary. Um, it's a, an ethical consideration in terms of the, uh, the plan giving field. You get a salary. There are no uh, commissions for there a no big gift. There's no bonuses sending, for diverting the money to one hospital over the other. Oh, absolutely not. I think there's <laughs> even federal. Uh, re I think I could go to jail for that or something. So no, we, we, we don't do that. So you get an honest. What we what I'm able to do is sit down in a confidential way and talk to people about their wealth and their families in an unbiased way because I don't have an agenda. Um, somebody said to me, well, you want their money? And I'm like, yes, but I only talk to people who come to me first and say, I want to do something, I'm not sure how. So we're in alignment on trying to figure out the best way to come up with making a gift. Right, and so what about tax benefits? Do you talk to them about that? Oh, we, cer we certainly would. Uh, uh, our role is to provide education. Um, uh, we, we don't pro provide legal or, t or tax advice, we, but what we do is we bring in their advisors. So then my role is to sit down almost as a quarterback, if you will, and we will bring together all of the advisors around the table at the same time. The attorney, the financial advisor, the insurance broker, whoever there might be in terms of the advisors, and we'll say, here's what the donor wants to do. These are their values. Here's what they want to accomplish. How do we go about doing this? And we'll come up with some recommendations. 
and then from there, um, if the donor says yes, I'd like to, I'd like to set up a charitable trust. I love these institutions. Um, I have assets that would be good to uh, fund this trust, maybe real estate that we're not using anymore, and then we would work with the advisors to to set everything up. So are those my advisors as the donor, or are they your advisors? Oh, they're your advisors. They I work see. for you, mm -hmm. absolutely. That there, there'd be a fiduciary responsibility for them to work in your best interest. Okay. Uh, yes. Right, and I, I appreciate you mentioned this is all confidential. It is highly confidential. And I know you do house visits. All the time. Mm -hmm. um, the, the work we do, I sign the same confidentiality agreements that your doctor would when you go to the hospital. I can be fired immediately for, for sharing uh, confidential information. So what we talk about is, uh, it's all just, yeah, I can't, you know, it's your family. It's very confidential. Yeah. yeah, and I've also read that uh, the larger group of donors are women. Absolutely, not men. And tell us about that. Well, you know, is that true for Strop for uh, St your hospital? Oh, too? I, in all the institutions I've worked for, worked with, um, you know, the the guys tend to not live as long as the women. Um, uh, the guys tend to. These are all stereotypes and generalities, but many times the guys um, are more. Uh, they want their name on a building. I yeah. see. So they're giving. They, they might be giving for other. Less charitable, but more maybe self interest. I can't say that because all our donors are just wonderful. Of course. Okay. Um, but I find that women, for the most part, they really want to make an impact. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, and I will say that for plan giving, men and women, the. They're the best people I've ever worked with in my entire life. They are caring. They say things like uh, they are stewards of these gifts. They want to open doors for others. They are not interested in the, the naming opportunities as maybe a major gift donor might, might want to do. Uh, Which would be like naming a building would have to be, the gift would have to be during lifetime probably, right? Well, um, generally you see generally, it that way right. because usually an institution will have a capital campaign and yeah. they'll say uh, name our campus or our wing or something like that. My, my role and most of plan giving roles is really not so much naming because um, well, we don't know when the person's going to pass away so it's not naming for this capital campaign. Therefore, most of the money goes into endowments to support research, to support whatever the donor wants to support. They tend to be more endowment driven. Scholarships, endowments, uh, chairs, uh, supporting professors. Scientific research. Scientific to research. Cures to cancer. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have a number of donors that support uh, uh, both us and organizations like St. Jude's. So, right. because we also do uh, pediatric cancer research. So, they'll say, I want to support research. Uh, I can use her name. A wonderful woman passed away a little while ago, uh, uh, Betty Funiyama. Uh, her husband had been cared for by the hospital, and she felt that her husband had six additional years of life because of the, the cardiology team at the hospital. And so she said, I don't know what I want to do. Then my role was to sit down and talk, listen to her story, and we finally developed a plan where some of the money would go in to support the uh, cardiology team today with current equipment and needs, and part would go to a endowment in his name for cardiology research. Oh, that's what we do. Wonderful. So look, we talked about gender. Let's talk about um, generally what's the right age, and you know, do you see millennials uh, in that frame of mind to begin planning, um, or is it mostly? <laughs> well, I, I tend Later. to deal with a little bit more senior okay. uh, senior folks, but the baby boomers are the really baby the baby boomers are the ones right now that are really looking at. We're working uh, increasingly with families, baby boomer families who have businesses, and they are uh, over the next ten years. There's going to be a huge transfer of ownership among family businesses because of the the baby boomers age, are retiring. Yeah. Um, the World War II guys came back. They worked for 40 years. They came back from the war in 45. By the mid-80s, they were selling businesses. They were bought and started by baby boomers, and now today, 40 years later, the baby boomers are uh, looking at what are we going to do. And then my role is simply to say, what's your plan? And many of them don't have a plan. So we talk about their values and help them with, with the succession planning. I see. Because if they're charitably inclined, that is where they can have significant impact 
in creating a, a gift to Hawaii, to give back to Hawaii. To create a legacy. To create a legacy. To benefit Hawaii. Yes, right. absolutely. Do you see a growing interest in philanthropy now? Oh, absolutely. Uh -huh. I think for us, uh, certainly on the plan giving side, right. people uh, tend to reach a point in their lives where they're reflective. And they're saying, what, what do I want to do? What meaningful thing do I want to, to leave behind? Those are the people that I work with. Right. Well, we just have a minute. And right. uh, I know that you have an upcoming seminar. So is that program something that's open to the public? And maybe uh, you could tell our audience, look right into the camera, too, about this program. Uh, we have this Thursday. We have a few seats left. We're going to be at the Hawaii Prince Hotel. Values-based estate planning. Dr. Wendy Hirsch, who is a child psychologist therapist at Kapilani, and I will be speaking there. Um, our number would be 535-7134, and we've got about five seats left if people would like to come and look at values-based estate planning. Is there a charge? No charge, and we'll feed you lunch. Okay, wow. I know. So that's a wonderful way to end our show, to invite people to attend uh, the program, learn more about plan giving, and um, in particular about Hawaii Pacific Health and your, your hospitals. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Well, this brings us to the end of today's show. I'm your host, Carol Mon Lee. Our guest has been Jeff Peterson from Hawaii Pacific Health, and we've been talking about plan giving, leaving your legacy for the benefit of others. So thanks to our production engineer, Ray Sangalang, and our floor manager, Cindy Manafakai, and all the people who contribute to Think Tech Productions. If you want to see the show again, go to thinktechhawaii.com or youtube.com slash thinktechhawaii, where there will be a link to more shows just like this one. Thank you for watching, and aloha.